Hey everyone, Josh Neighbors here. This is the Neighborhood Watch here on a Tuesday. It is the 26th of September 2023 on today's show. Our first Big 12 power rankings. I waited four weeks. I wanted to get some data, but we're a third of the way through the season. It's now time to start ranking these teams in the Big 12 conference and see where we think they stack up. Make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. Like the videos as well. That is the best way for us to spread these around. So if you guys like them, that is always a massive help. Please find us on the social medias. The artist formerly known as Twitter, now X. You guys can find me at Josh Neighbors underscore there. Also at NWPod365. At Josh Neighbors underscore is where you guys will get my weekly Big 12 bread truck picks. We're backing that thing up. Last week, we were 4-2. and two. So overall now on the season, we are now 13. And let's see, I believe uh, 9, I think, at this point in time. So 13 and 9, making you all some cash. So make sure you guys find us there. If you all cannot watch the show on the YouTubes, the best way you guys can keep up with the show is you guys can find us wherever you get your podcast. So if you're driving, don't watch on YouTube. Watch later. Go home later and like the videos if you guys are driving, you can go ahead and uh, find us in those places and also five-star review. All right, so I think now is time. We'll do it as every Tuesday, the power rankings. Uh, basically, you all are starting to get a flow for how the season goes, right? On Saturday slash Sunday, we'll do the winner's circle, if you will, right? The Big 12 winners in the weekend, what we take away. Monday is the kind of loser's reflection show. Then we have got the Tuesday power rankings, which will come out, and that'll help us turn the page. And then Wednesday, we'll start looking forward to the week and handling some you know, big picture business. Then Thursday and Friday, obviously, we are previewing the matchups for the weekend. So that's how it's going to work here during the season. I'm uh, at 103.7 The Buzz, my place of employment today, because there's some other stuff I had to take care of. So we're recording the show, this version, here today. All right, let's get to the power rankings. So before I show them to you all, I want to let you all know how I do them is this. Part of it is what you have shown me. Part of it is if you played on a neutral field, what would happen? And then part of it's head-to-head. Now, that gets trickier as the season goes along, especially in the old Big 12. It was harder because everybody played everybody, but it's a combination of factors. And I'll kind of talk you all how I go through things. It's hard. It's, you know, sometimes not an exact science, but I think you guys will kind of get the gist of how I see things. And you all can let me know if you agree or disagree. So here are the first version of, of your neighborhood watch power rankings. Once again, we are a third of the way through the season. So Texas is at number one, K-State number two, Oklahoma is at number three, Kansas at four, and TCU is number five. Once again, Texas, K-State, Oklahoma, Kansas, TCU in your top five. Then you've got UCF at six, West Virginia at seven, BYU at eight, Texas Tech at nine, Iowa State at number 10, Oklahoma State at number 11, Houston, Baylor, and Cincinnati in that order rounded up. Once again, 6 through 14. UCF, West Virginia, BYU, Texas Tech, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, Houston, Baylor, and then Cincinnati. So the reason well, we'll start at the top, right? There's really no debate about who is the number one team in the Big 12. The number three ranked team in the country are the Texas Longhorns. They are my number one team. And the reason being for that, folks, is that there's just not much of an argument. When it comes to talent, they're the most talented team in the league. When it comes to a national uh, scale, guys, I mean, I think there's a pretty good argument that they still, through four weeks of the season, have the best singular win at Tuscaloosa against Alabama. I know that you know the LSU game for uh, Florida State is a massive victory for them. I don't want to take away from that at all. But I feel like if you factor in on the road against that coach in that environment for a program that's not been winning the big game in the last few years, especially the way it went down last year at home, going on the road and taking care of the job shows you that quality. And that is the best win, I think, in the country this year. And look, has Texas been perfect? No, they have not. Sorry, as we have that go off. Uh, Has Texas been perfect? No, they have not been perfect so far this season. But despite that, I mean, none of these teams really have been. The number two team in the conference I have right now, K-State, is not undefeated. So, you know, it doesn't mean, like, just because you have a loss does not mean, that you you know, you're uh, you're imperfect, right? But, like, just because you're undefeated does not mean you're perfect as well. Kind of both those things can be true. So 
with the way that team has looked, I know a lot of you don't like Texas, but I told you all coming in, and folks all across the league were telling you coming in, this team is like noticeably more talented than everybody else. The next, I guess, most talented team is OU, and and I mean, they're playing in two weeks, guys, and Texas, to me right now especially, looks like the far superior team. Maybe Oklahoma's defense is a lot better, but uh, Texas's offense has been making teams pay. Now, they haven't done it from the start, from the get-go, whatever, but like they made Alabama pay over and over and over again. And uh, Quinn Ewers can make those challenging throws, and if a defense says Quinn beat us, he can beat you at this point in time. So I feel like Texas, no doubt about it. Will they trip up? Will they go 100%? No, and they've got a tough game against KU this week. But to me, number one in the league with a bullet. Number two, Kansas State. So the reason why I've got K-State above Oklahoma and above KU is this. With Will Howard even injured this week, it was not an amazing performance, right? But they still beat UCF. And you can still, and and even without Daniel Green too, which is going to hurt them, I think, uh, towards the end of the season. But Daniel Green uh, being out is obviously a massive loss. Will Howard being nicked up is huge, but they're still fighting. They're still winning games. And and even though that Missouri game, they were not, they did not run the ball as well as they could have. Um, they were still in that thing to the very end. It took Missouri, I mean, a Herculean effort for them to end up, you know, kick at the end to to beat them. And I thought K State was actually the better team in that game overall. And that's coming from Missouri alum. I, I did not think the better team actually won that game. Uh, you know, K State against them last year was one way traffic. This year, Missouri is a much better team and gets the win by the hair of a chinny chin chin. But I still think this Chris Kleiman group is is on track to to go back to another Big Twelve championship game. And once there's a lot of stuff I want them to clean up. And missing Deuce Vaughn is huge for them. And I'm not sure this wide receiver core is great. But Will Howard's command of the offense, he can maintain his health. They will be in great shape. And the good news for them is a bye week this week will help them get there. So I think based off of what they brought back from last year, based off of what I've seen so far, are they going to hit up maybe a higher ceiling than what we thought we saw last year? Maybe not, right? But can they still be roughly what they were last year? Yeah, and what they were last year were Big 12 champions. Maybe pillar to post, not the best team in the league, and they did lose to, uh, you know, they, they beat Oklahoma, but they did, uh, you know, took that lump and that loss to Tulane, really good team, to TCU, obviously very good team. And the Texas and Texas played one of their better games against them last season, but like K State went up against a really strong Missouri team that's got a dynamic player in Luther Burden, and that's going to be a challenge for K State when they play schools like Texas, who have the Xavier Worthies of the world and have a really good offensive line, have a good quarterback and whatnot. I mean, you know, is it going to be the great plays that beat them again, or can they actually force some mistakes? I'm curious to see that. But so far from what I've seen, K State to me is still the second best team in the league. You might not be. You might say, "Oh, Josh, I don't know about 100 percent." But look, those two non-con games they had were, you know, pretty, uh, pretty much walks in the park. The non outside of Missouri, and then the end of the game against UCF was a fist fight in the end. But they still, you know, poured it on late in the game. And uh, I've got confidence about this team, and I think their confidence will grow. And I think Will Howard's a really really good quarterback. I mean, I think the top tier quarterbacks in this league. Looking at these teams, at the top right now, guys, think about this. Quinn Ewers has played really well. Will Howard has played really well. Dylan Gabriel, for the most part, has played really well. Jalen Daniels, actually, I think, has left some stuff to be desired, but like he is commanding a team that's 4-0 at Kansas, so like, what else am I going to be asking for, right? But I actually I think really highly of him, so I actually think he's got room to, to keep elevating. Uh, you know, those top four guys, those top four teams, I mean, those are your four best quarterbacks in the league, right? Like, I don't think any other team behind them has a quarterback that's got an argument to be in the conversation. Cincinnati doesn't. Baylor doesn't. Houston doesn't. Oklahoma State's got, they can't even figure out who their best quarterback is. Tyler Shuck might have had a case, but he goes down. Keaton Slovis, I don't think so. Obviously, we know that West Virginia's dealing with their issues, and then UCF's got injuries as well. And I don't even know if John Rice, I don't think John Rice Plumley's better than any four of those guys. So that's why I've got K-State number two, because they've got a quarterback who's, who's up at the top level. Oklahoma. In that number three spot, and I think this one's compelling between OU and Kansas. Oklahoma's, uh, you know, um, their SMU game was like a slow burn. The Cincinnati game, they could have put their foot down more, right? But they're winning these games. The defense looks better, and I want to see when they get tested later on. Obviously, it's hard to be like, will 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 things go sideways and then continue to go sideways, right? When you think about Oklahoma last season and what went wrong for the Sooners. They had that good start, and then 
well, they lose the quarterback, obviously, and they can't stop anybody. 41 points against K-State uh, allowed, 55 against TCU, 49 against Texas, 42 against Kansas, 38 against Baylor, right? Uh, you know, they got better at the end there, but still at the end of the season, 51 against Texas Tech, 35 in the bowl game as well, and take bowl games for what they're worth. But you can see, like, Things did not improve until they played significantly worse competition on defense, or for their defense, I should say. West Virginia and Oklahoma State with a banged-up Spencer Sanders. And that that game against uh, Oklahoma State was one of the best defensive performances they had all of last season. Probably their best one in the Big 12 Conference, but still to me, you know, I, I think... It's. It looks like it's a different unit. It looks like they've uh, did a little bit of a uh, you know cleaning things up. They've they've kind of you know uh, if it's like a bowl of pasta, they've shaken that bowl. They made sure all the, everything loose is going away. Right, the strainer. They're getting the parts of this team that they want to have, and they're assembling them, especially on defense. On offense, like I, I'm curious of, as to how good the running attack is. Uh, I know people like you know uh, Walker, obviously, and Marcus Major's been there for a long time too, right? And Javante Barnes, somebody they like, oh, they like a lot. And Dylan Gabriel can be a part of this rushing attack, but like, how actually good is this rushing attack? And then for receiving for them, you know, they've got Andrew Anthony, obviously transferring in, and they've got Jaleel Farouk, or they're expecting a lot, uh, you know, a lot from this year. And Drake Stoops is kind of old, reliable, like. I just think that if you compare talent, they've got some, but they need that talent to elevate. And if I think about the other really talented teams in the league, you know, I, I kind of like them more. Like Kansas State, not as talented, uh, like pure talent, star rating talent, but I like their development. I like their horses better than I like Oklahoma's in terms of performance. Then Texas obviously has them beat as well. And so I think that's why it's more of a conversation for me about them and KU as opposed to Oklahoma and K-State. I honestly believe that. Now, if Oklahoma's defense proves to be the genuine article, it's a different conversation. But we all saw what happened last year after their hot start, so I think it's worth some time on this. Kansas at number four. Kansas is getting very good results so far this season. I will say, and I'll keep saying this, I do think there's like 20% of this team that is still old KU. And I think Lance Leipold is trying to get that out. And that's with roster depth and getting these guys, you know, building this thing up. But you think about what they've done so far this year. Missouri State took care of business. They had a Power 5 team in Illinois come to them. They, they was kind of weird late, right? The Nevada game, that was kind of old KU, but they get the win. And then BYU, like once that second half started, it was all KU. And that was actually the big thing for Lance Leipold starting off was the team would start well in games, uh, you know, his first season, and then they would not finish the game well. Well, they had to actually finish the games. Last season, they started well, but they couldn't finish the season off well enough, in my opinion. This year, it's kind of about finishing in all facets, in the individual games themselves, and in the season, can they maintain their strength all the way through. But a 4-0 start, once again in the top 25, a dynamic rushing attack where they've got three guys in the backfield. And here's the thing. I actually like the fact, I do not feel like they're putting Jalen Daniels in harm's way that often. And I think that's obviously by design. But 27 carries so far in the three games that he has played, right? Uh, Nine attempts against BYU, seven attempts against Nevada, and 11 attempts against Illinois, right? And this last game against BYU was by far his best rushing performance so far in the season. And he's completing guys over 74%. He's basically at 75% completion. So he has been really efficient. I've loved the way that Neal and Hyshaw have been running the football for them this year. And I actually think their pass catchers, like Lawrence Arnold's a good player. Luke Grimm's a good player, right? They can use tight ends as well uh, in this offense. And they can use running backs as well in this offense. And once again, they're two featured backs, guys. And also McDuffie's uh, been carrying for them some as well. But Neal and Hyshaw this year between them have 90 carries at this point in time. And uh, Hyshaw's at 7.1 a carry and Neal's at 6.9 a carry. Right, they've got eight touchdowns between them in terms of totals for the year together. They are collectively uh, north of 600 yards. Right, so they're they're doing the job on the ground, and that's huge for them because it allows them to control the clock, it allows them to maintain possession, it allows them to dictate pace. Like Kansas slugged it out with Texas a couple years ago and beat them, right, which is a great win. But I don't know if you want to do that now. 
I know you like your horses, but I think Texas is, is they might be able to stop you all the time, but they've got a good enough defense to get some stops against this KU team. And so what I think the approach has to be for the Kansas Jayhawks is, you know, limit the number of possessions, you know, and and then make Quinn Ewers make some mistakes. And don't run the don't run the number of possessions up in the game and give them more opportunities to score and whatnot. Trust your execution because when it comes to executing, Quinn Ewers is really good, but Jalen Daniels like might be the best, like we got to have a score here. We need a score. We got a score. The last two weeks, they've done it like every single time. Kind of been like, okay, this game could be in the balance. He stretches out the lead, or he gets in the lead, or he takes care of business. And he's kind of the guy, you know. Quinn, once again, Quinn's been really good. But if you trust somebody the most right now, I mean, Jalen Daniels got to be a guy you trust up there with Will Howard, just because uh, Will Howard's one one too. But Jalen Daniels shows you that quality, especially full strength, and it looks like he's. Roughly at full strength right now, which is great news for KU. But they're a top five team. Number five, I've got TCU. I don't know if it's real. That's why, once again, it's a third away through the seasons. There's a third, but they've also been some kind of exhibition type games in, in these parts of the season. But I do feel like TCU is improving. I felt like from the word go, they were a better team. I felt really good about them minus six and a half this week. They double up SMU. And it feels like they're starting to find that rhythm and that groove. And it feels like almost that loss to Colorado, put TCU on the back burner in a lot of ways and has allowed them now to recover. And I think Garrett Riley is getting his footing, as is Chandler Morris. I think Imani Bailey has been strong. I think their defense is starting to hit once again. The quality of tackling has to be there, but they like to pop you. They like to get after you. They like to cause forced turnovers and make big plays. And they're an adjustment defense as well, too. They've been doing all that stuff pretty well, I think, in the last uh, you know couple weeks like the way they took care of business against Houston, like the way against SMU. Now, those rosters aren't quite as good as theirs, so they should be. But still, if you look at a down year in the Big 12, TCU's proving they're towards back, and once again, the top, at least, I think, for right now. That's your top five. Texas, K-State, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, TCU. So then you go further past that. UCF, to me, because the coach, because the fact they're missing uh, JRP, because the fact that they actually played pretty well against K-State, I'm going to put them sixth, and I think they should be there just because like the talent level on that team is high. They've got playmakers all over the place. So I think you know if you're going, hey, UCF, West Virginia, like neutral field type situation, I would take UCF. That's why I've got them a bit higher. West Virginia, though, they're top half of the league because their quality of play and the way they've been getting after teams' asses on the line of scrimmage, the way they're playing on defense, the passion, the care, the belief. That's I mean, they are a like you know they're just basically a. a, a like a metaphor, you know, like whatever kind of uh, buzzwords you want to use to describe a football team that plays well together. That is what West Virginia is. That's why they deserve to be top seven right now. And I think they are a little bit better than BYU at the moment, just in terms of a collective unit. Eight is BYU. I've got them ahead of Texas Tech. So BYU, we always kind of knew this. Like they're actually right where we thought they would be, a middling team in this league. And they're kind of maybe top half some weeks, maybe below that some weeks, right? They're right there. Texas Tech is still number nine for me, even at one and three, because look at their losses. Overtime by two points to Wyoming. The Oregon game was close to the very end of that game. And their loss, obviously, this past week was a close one as well. They are losing these close games and even a chance after Tyler Shuck goes down. So they're losing in the margins right now. And that's why they are number nine in the rankings, right? But like they could jump up. I actually I did a show yesterday about the three schools that are really down bad. Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, and um, and Baylor, and I feel best about Texas Tech, even though the record. Like, if Texas Tech played Oklahoma State neutral field today, I would take a Texas Tech in a heartbeat, even with Baron Morton. I just I don't trust Oklahoma State at all. Could be a closer game, but like I know Oklahoma State's two and two. But what does that win against Arizona State really mean? You've you've gotten you know uh, shit can for lack of a better word the last two weeks against Iowa State and Oklahoma State or Iowa State and South Alabama. That's why I've got them, uh, Texas Tech number nine. Iowa State coming off a win. Matty Campbell got them in the top 10, so there you go. Oklahoma State right there at number 11. Houston at number 12. Baylor at number 13. And Cincinnati at 14. It's a real dogfight at the bottom between Baylor and Cincinnati. And if you said, hey, Baylor didn't deserve to be there, they got one win against LIU, I wouldn't fight you on that. They were pretty close against a good uh, uh, Utah team. Didn't get the job done. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. And if you said, Josh, well, Cincinnati's got a better win, I would say, yes, that is true. They also have had two bad losses. Well, bad losses. Oklahoma loss wasn't too bad. Uh, back to back. Honestly, actually, Cincinnati should be 13 over Baylor. You know, kind of live uh, uh, censorship here on the fly of myself. 
So there you go. That's the, that's the power rankings for this week, and even a mea culpa in the power rankings. All right, so to wrap this show up today, let's uh, kind of spin it forward. Think about what we have coming up this weekend of the Big 12. Friday night, we've got Cincinnati and BYU. BYU is only a two-and-a-half-point favorite at home, and they should be more than that. Um, Texas, and that's one of those guys. I would jump on that now because that line's going to move. So jump on that now. That's also why we do this too. Texas, 230 on ABC against Kansas. Last year, Texas took care of KU. This year, or uh, two years ago when it was last in Austin, KU got the job done. Obviously a very compelling game for multiple reasons. And Texas could be a look-ahead spot here, right? Mentioned the every other week thing. Alabama, big game. Didn't look good before Rice, though, and the Rice game before that. Uh, Wyoming, they weren't excellent the entire way. This week was a big game, obviously. They beat the brakes off of Baylor. And they got Oklahoma next week, so are they going to be caught in between? I'm curious about that. Houston and Texas Tech. This is a huge game for each one of these teams. Texas Tech, for more how the season goes, if Houston pulls off this victory, guys, uh, Dana Holgerson got a little bit more momentum back. But still, uh, this is a pretty big game there. Baylor against UCF. UCF, guys, is 11.5 point favorite at home against Baylor. Uh, Roster-wise, that should not be the case. That should not be where Baylor is. 6 o'clock, Iowa State against Oklahoma. Oklahoma's going to have to contend with a red-hot Rocco Becht right now. You don't want to deal with Rocco Becht. He's slinging the ball around. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that game, you know, I think Oklahoma's going to take care of business. And once again, the reason why we all thought, oh, you had a good chance to probably go and win the Big 12 this year, folks, was because the schedule's pretty soft. The schedule's pretty soft. Uh, West Virginia and TCU, 7 o'clock, ESPN2. Outside of OU in Texas, or excuse me, KU in Texas, this is the game that I am most excited for this week. And the reason being is that West Virginia is playing really good football. TCU is rebounded. I want to see how good this team is. And I think TCU's defense or offense rather will get tested by West Virginia's defense. I do think though it's a tough matchup for them because TCU does know what West Virginia wants to do, and they're pretty good at identifying what teams want to do and making it happen uh, on defense, at least in my opinion. So I, I think that's where I am on, on that front. Uh, but that's that's what we're playing for this week. All right, folks, that will do it for today's show. Make sure you follow us on X slash Twitter at Josh Neighbors underscore at NWPod365 is where you guys can find me. Also, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and then like the video, and please leave your comments on what you all thought about my power rankings. All right, folks, see you tomorrow.